if you're intentionally observing, you're likely to notice something new. You're likely to learn something about how your mind or organism works. And for me, this fits quite well into a kind of meditation. Of course, meditation is this huge umbrella category. And now as to science being meditation, that depends who's doing it and what your definition of science is. But my definition of science is something like the careful pursuit of truth. Um, the careful, rigorous, skeptical, patient, and intellectually humble pursuit of knowledge, which is very similar as the meditative attitude I think ought to be towards our experience if we are to learn something new. And similarly, if we're to learn something about the world, which really is also part of who we are, um, then I think science becomes a kind of analytical meditation. And indeed, some meditative practices are, are, are very mind-centered. And I think a, a lot of the time people think meditation is get, just getting rid of the mind, uh, which I think is absurd. Uh, that's not at all what it is in, in my view. In fact, a key part of meditation is insight, is, is understanding, is, is not just kind of becoming some sort of blob that exists in this sort of um, loose state of light and is incapable of having a wise or philosophical thought or making technological or scientific progress. No, I, th I think if the meditation is working, it should be enlivening us and making us better in all domains. And that includes our capacity to, to do science. Um, so I, I don't know, maybe that's what I have to say about that <laughs> to kind of retroactively justify comments that I made to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think I'm getting more convinced because before, as I told you, for me, meditation is this, uh, you know, monk sitting in a cave and, uh, you know, <laughs> and <w> watching <laughs> the wall for four hours or something like that. So that's for me, meditation. I mean, I'm stereotyping, yeah. of course. And what I might just sort of add to that is that as we're, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, but the further we've, we're going into science, especially in, in neuroscience and the kinds of fields I'm interested in, phenomenology becomes central. Um, and in fact, to do careful third-person science, you also need a rigorous first-person science, a kind of rigorous, careful approach to phenomenology, where we make sense of our experience in a consistent and useful way such that we can actually model that experience and then also make sense of it using neural data and um, and computational modeling and so on. And so actually, I think more and more, the meditators are becoming uh, valuable for science as we realize that we can't make progress in consciousness uh, on consciousness without a rigorous first person approach, because what we define as consciousness can go all wrong unless we have someone who has a bit of nuance about their experience and can make sense of what's actually going on there. What is your understanding of mind and self? And especially if we put it in the context of non-duality as a scientist and as a meditator? Well, it's always tempting to say something about whether it exists or doesn't exist. The mind, Please the do. self, and Please all of these do. things. Please do. But we are interested. <laughs> well, 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 I might, might might have a boring answer to this because actually, I think it's 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 neither that it exists or doesn't exist, but it 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 does have certain characteristics. It does seem to be follow certain patterns, arise under certain causes and conditions, and more and more, I would say also that our understanding of the mind and self. Um, is converging from both, again, the experiential side and the scientific side. So take, for example, the predictive processing or active inference accounts of mind and how the, how the self is generated there. Um, so these kind of leading models, are kind of the predominant paradigm in cognitive neuroscience at the moment, suggests that all of our experience, even our what seems to be our direct perception, is a is generated through a process of prediction error minimization 
That is to say that it's constructed by the organism trying to model reality. We somehow are trying to simulate our reality such that we can act in it ad adaptively. And of course, we have to generate that kind of simulation because there's no other way for us to function in the world. We have no direct access to the world. We can only infer it through our senses, only infer it through the two-dimensional data coming in through the, through the eyes and through the ears and through our bodies and all of the internal interceptive systems. So somehow from all of this information, we have to actually model our, our reality. And we can see that that model goes wrong sometimes. We can have all kinds of breakdowns in the model. Um, we can have visual illusions, auditory illusions. In fact, anything that the mind can generate can and has at some point in history with some person gone wrong and broken down. So whatever is being generated is error prone and is to some extent we can say an inference, a prediction that the system is making. Now that includes the mind and the self. Um, and so that means that at a kind of very base level, we're forced to conclude um, based on contemporary neuroscience, but also what you end up discovering through direct experience through things like meditation, that the self is not a permanent enduring entity, but in some sense, a construction um, and, and that doesn't make it any less interesting or beautiful or any of those things and, and even valuable. I mean, it's there to, to serve us and to serve our survival and our, um, our capacity to enjoy life, but it is not what we might ordinarily take it to be. And even the fact that we take it to be this sort of enduring permanent thing is of course makes a lot of sense from an evolutionary perspective. We need to assume that this, this organism here, this system, is the most important thing in the world. We need to take that seriously. Otherwise, we would not do all the things that we need to do to pursue our ex existence and the existence of our offspring and so on. So it makes perfect sense that evolution has selected for the self and this mind to be misapprehended as something truly real and permanent, because most likely those that assumed that it was truly real and permanent were the ones that survived because the monks uh, of, of old probably reproduced a lot less. Uh, I think that's, that's probably a, a fair um, judgment.